On what was supposed to be a day like any other for farmers digging a well near the city of Xi'an, China in 1974, quickly turned extraordinary when the terracotta head of an ancient Chinese warrior was unearthed. The farmers never did get their well built, but they did discover one of the greatest archaeological finds in the world. So, like, I I guess that's an acceptable consolation. This is the terracotta army of Emperor Qing Shi Huangdi, and it's about to blow your mind. Hey friends, welcome back to Dig It With Raven, and welcome to the Imperial China Project. Also, new set. This is my dissertation. It is a weird murder board. I know. We're just gonna save this to the end over here. Just wait till the end, it's worth it. I'm part of another really fun collaboration playlist with a bunch of other history YouTubers today, all about Imperial China. Of course, with a topic like that, you just know that your girl's gonna have to do a little bit of a rant about the terracotta warriors and the first emperor of a unified China. Let's get into it. The story of the terracotta army all starts with someone named Ying Cheng, who came to rule the Qin state of China in 247 BCE at the tender age of 13 during the tail end of the Warring States period. The Warring States period in China was, well, it, a period of, of warring states that lasted for over 200 years in pursuit of territorial you know, power and dominance and all that stuff. I personally can't really imagine being 13 and ruling the most powerful state at the time during all this upheaval and turmoil, but Ying Cheng seemed up for the challenge and he did not disappoint, that's for sure. Ying Cheng was a determined, ruthless leader, and by the year 221 BCE, through the use of some, you know, some espionage, some extensive bribery, and some very very talented military leaders. He eliminated all rival states and created a unified China under the state of Qin. To commemorate his achievement, Ying Cheng changed his name to Qing Shi Huangdi, which translates to First Sovereign Emperor. He also claimed that his dynasty was going to last 10,000 generations, and this was a little bit too much girl boss energy, if you ask me. But hey, man unites China after hundreds of years of war? I guess he's entitled to, you know, a, a few bragging rights here and there. Jing Shi Huangdi reigned for 36 years, and even though his dynasty didn't last as long as he hoped or said it would, he did accomplish some pretty amazing things that are. They're impressive, they're impressive. He implemented intensive administration reforms, built an extensive road network, as well as a bunch of other infrastructure projects. He also introduced the standardization of writing, weights and measurements, and currency all throughout China. Oh yeah, and he was also the mastermind behind the creation of a little something called the Great Wall of China. So yeah, maybe his fancy title was indeed justified. Like, he wasn't the nicest guy. Man burned a lot of books, killed a lot of people, but he did a lot of things and he left a lot of Im immense marks on the world. Not that that justifies any of his other not so savory actions, of course, but uh, I just wanted to just wanted to put that out there. China's first emperor had a bit of a complex though. He seemed to be just a little bit afraid of his own mortality. I mean, who isn't a little bit wary of their own demise? But this guy took it to the next level. Qing Shi Huangdi spent the last years of his life in pursuit of immortality, becoming obsessed with the fabled elixir of life. He employed countless alchemists to create supposed immortal concoctions for him, and he even sent off expeditions to these fabled faraway places to find these also fabled mythical people who would supposedly help him in his quest for eternal life. Clearly, no elixir of life was ever found, but have no fear! Man was prepared. As early as his first year of reign, Emperor Qin began the construction of this massive, monumental underground mausoleum. And when I say massive, I mean massive. Just massive. The mausoleum was constructed over a 36 year pyramid and is located under a 76 meter tall pyramid esque mound. 
It's modeled after the Qin capital city of Xiangyang, and through remote sensing, archaeologists have determined that the entire complex measures to around 98 square kilometers. Massive, I tell you! This thing is huge! This mausoleum had everything that Emperor Qin would have needed in the afterlife. Similar to the ancient Egyptians and many other cultures, ancient China believed that you could actually bring things from this life into the afterlife with you. According to a source written by Han Dynasty historian in Sima Chiang, over 700,000 laborers and craftspeople worked day and night in order to finish this mausoleum. This is a huge number, and British historian John Men calculated that it probably wasn't 700,000 people that built this mausoleum because that number is larger than pretty much every city in the ancient world at that time. Instead, he did some fun math and calculated that about 16,000 people could have built the foundations of the mausoleum in about two years. It seems much more feasible. Even though his numbers are just, you know, just a little bit far-fetched, Sima Qiang's account of Emperor Qin's tomb is absolutely fantastic, and it paints this most amazing picture of one of the most opulent burials of all time. Palaces and scenic towers for a hundred officials were constructed, and the tomb was filled with rare artifacts and wonderful treasure. Craftsmen were ordered to make crossbows and arrows primed to shoot at anyone who enters the tomb. Mercury was used to simulate the Hundred Rivers, the Yangtze, Yellow River, and the Great Sea, and set to flow mechanically. Above were representations of the heavenly constellations. Below, the features of the land. Candles were made of fat from manfish, which is calculated to burn and not extinguish for a long time. What is perhaps the coolest thing about this fantastical description is that archaeologists have actually located the mound, the actual tomb itself of Emperor Qin, and have probed deep, deep, deep into the soil. The archaeologists found ridiculous amounts of mercury, like a hundred times its naturally occurring rate in this soil which means that there actually might be some truth behind Sima Chiang's uh, amazing story of this tomb, which just makes my imagination go wild with the possibilities of like, what could be under the ground in this tomb? I want to know, I need to know. Of course, it wasn't all, you know, rainbows in paradise though and buried treasure. Sima Chiang did note that some not so nice things occurred after the construction of the mausoleum. After the burial, it was suggested that it would be a serious breach if the craftsmen who constructed the mechanical devices and knew of its treasures were to divulge their secrets. Therefore, after the funeral ceremonies had completed and the treasures hidden away, the inner passageway was blocked and the outer gate lowered, immediately trapping all the workers and craftsmen inside. None could escape. Trees and vegetations were then planted on the tomb mound, such that it resembles a hill. Again, this guy really knew how to tell a story, and also Emperor Qin clearly never heard the phrase, secrets don't make friends, because clearly I want to know all of his secrets, and if he's not gonna tell me all of his secrets, we ain't gonna be friends. I'm only a little bit bitter about all of the supposed lost technology and secrets that that are in this tomb. Just, just, just a bit. Another really fascinating thing to me about Sima Chiang's depiction and account of this tomb is his omission of the archaeological find that has captivated the minds and imaginations of everyone all over the world for the past 50 years, the Terracotta Army. As we talked about earlier, the ancient Chinese believed that you could just take things from this life into the next after death. So naturally, Emperor Qin believed that he required an army to take with him into the afterlife to protect him and also to continually reassert his dominance and defeat his enemies in the next world. Luckily, he didn't actually bring an entire living physical army with him. Instead, he decided to get a little bit more creative instead of sacrificing thousands and thousands of people to make this happen. And thus the Terracotta army was created, and these warriors are insane, to say the least. The Terracotta army consists of at least 8,000 statues of soldiers still standing in battle formation, ready to fight for the emperor. In fact, the army faces east because that is the likely direction that an enemy would come from to attack the underground mausoleum. The army itself is split across several pits in the mausoleum. The largest contains the main force of 6,000 life-size soldiers, and another includes 130 war chariots pulled by 
520 horses alongside 150 cavalry horses. Oh yeah, they made terracotta horses too, and they are. They're super cool. A third pit houses what is called the high command, which I'm assuming is just like the really important people. And then there's this like fourth empty pit, which suggests that this giant building project wasn't finished by the time that Emperor Qin was interred, even though he'd already been dead for like four years by the time they buried him in this thing in 206 BCE. But guys, I haven't even gotten to the crazy stuff yet. One of the most incredible things about the terracotta army is that while the craftspeople working on these statues only used about eight different mix and match molds of body parts for their construction, no two are exactly alike. Yeah. Eight thousand statues, each unique in its own individual way, just like every warrior in a real army would be. The warriors stand according to rank, they possess various bronze weapons, of which I think about 40 thousand of them have been uncovered so far, including battle axes, spears, arrowheads, all that fun stuff, crossbows. They have different uniforms and they also have distinct hairstyles. Artists individualize each statue by hand to create unique facial features and expressions, including like ears of all different shapes and sizes. And I don't know why the ear thing is, is so exciting for me, but it, it is, it just, Ears. These guys even added individual tread patterns and different sort of ties on their shoes. Shoes! The soldiers are also of varying heights because obviously not everyone is the same height. Who did this? They, who was crazy enough to be like, listen, we're gonna make an army. It's gonna be 8,000 people strong. And you know, we could, we could streamline this, we could, but we won't. What looks like what might have been a highly standardized conveyor belt construction is actually a huge artistic endeavor and a testament to individuality. None of these guys were really that short though. Like they would all do very, very well on dating apps today. Most of the statues are around five foot 11 with the tallest coming in at six foot seven. That means the tallest ones are Kawhi Leonard Tall. They are Kawhi Leonard tall. Oh yeah, and everything was painted too. Regular warriors had these very like nice, bright, solid colors, whereas generals and higher ranking officials, they had a little bit more pizzazz, a little bit more spice with geometric patterns and even leaf patterns on their clothing. Unfortunately, pigments do fade over time and the army's exposure to air has led a lot of the paint to just dry and flake off from the, right from the ceramic, right from the terracotta, sometimes within minutes. So we don't have a lot of that evidence anymore. Luckily, conservation science has progressed really well over the past 50 years, and now we use something called polyethylene glycol as a consolidant or PEG or PEG, whatever you wanna call it, to kind of like help keep the paint and the pigments on the terracotta right when they come out of the ground. Chemical analysis into these pigments has also shown that inorganic chemistry was being practiced dur during the Qin Dynasty. The purple pigment that's found on some of the terracotta warriors is called barium copper silicate, which is an inorganic pigment also known as Han purple. The tomb complex wasn't all armies and defense though. Statues of workers, government officials, acrobats, dancers, strongmen, and musicians were also included alongside bronze animals, which indicates that Emperor Qin had a lot more than warfare planned for his afterlife. As far as most people can tell, the emperor's tomb was left unrated and untouched, though some literary records do say that his mausoleum was attacked towards the end of the Qin dynasty. Peasant armies and rebel forces did rise up against Qin rule after uh, Emperor Qin's death, and a rebel force led by Xiang Yu ransacked the capital of Xiangyang in 206 BC and according to Sima Chiang, these rebel forces opened the mausoleum and raided it for 30 days. Apparently even a month of looting could not exhaust the treasures that were inside of this tomb. Also according to Sima Chiang, bandits melted some of the bronze coffins that were in part of the, the tomb complex and then set fire to the place which apparently burned for 90 days. For conservation purposes, the main tomb containing the burial of Emperor Qin hasn't been opened yet. And because of this, we can't actually confirm any of the reports of this supposed plundering. However, the pits of the Guardian Army do show some signs of having been set on fire by intruders, and archaeologists have found charred bits of wood and pottery, as well as some, you know, scorched bits of earth. 
Furthermore, in Pit 3, many warrior statues were purposefully damaged, many of the terracotta figures were broken, statues were smashed, and even some of them were, were missing their heads. Many weapons were also missing from these pits, which means that was, was never that much of a secret. It, it wasn't. No. That being said, there is evidence of the main tomb remaining relatively intact. But since exposure to air and light is going to cause fading to all the pigments as well as degradation to anything else that might be in this tomb, archaeologists are waiting until the way can be found to expose the tomb without damaging any of its contents. So now we wait and we desperately fund heritage and conservation technology research in order to try and find a way to get into this damn thing so Raven can sleep at night. Thank you very much. Another reason to not really excavate the main tomb right now are those very high levels of mercury that we talked about earlier. Mercury is very toxic, even when it's not in retrograde, and if these mercury pools and rivers do exist within this tomb, we'll be putting a lot of people at risk and in danger for doing this. So yeah, we're kind of up the creek on that one. Emperor Chin's commitment to having all of these warriors and people enter the afterlife with him may seem unique, especially given the large scale in which he did it. But the entire concept of being buried with figurines and clay representations of humans, animals, and, and other things that were important during life isn't something totally unique to the terracotta warriors. For example, we have the Shaptis of ancient Egypt that were placed in tombs to carry out work for the deceased in the afterlife. And during the Kofun period in Japan, people were buried with statues of horses and houses. Sometimes these representations of people and animals weren't used though, and real the real things were killed and buried with these important rulers, which, well, I guess it sucked to be anyone that a big shot thought they needed. Luckily, Emperor Chin didn't do this for all of these people that he was representing, which had been done in other places around the world, as well as in earlier Chinese dynasties. That being said, Chin's body is not the only skeleton that is in this tomb complex. Archaeologists have unearthed mass graves of craftsmen and laborers, and apparently even some convicted criminals that were forced to work in chains. Yeah, iron handcuffs and collars were found on site, which has led some archaeologists and researchers to suggest that a portion of the laborers involved in the construction of the burial complex were criminals sentenced to hard labor. Also in a very central location, not too far from the emperor's tomb, a few of the approximate 90 other tombs in the area have been excavated. All of them have been empty, but there have been some disarticulated skeletons found in the doorways, which has some people suggesting that these were executed concubines. I haven't found anything in my research yet that proves Sima Qian's story that all of those that were involved in the building and the creation of, of the mausoleum were in fact buried alive, so that's a positive thing to hang on to, at least. The mausoleum of Emperor Qin and his amazing terracotta army provides archaeologists with amazing insights into the Qin dynasty military system, weaponry, dress, hairstyles, art, manufacturing techniques, and technology, and will continue to captivate and give us new insights into an ancient China for years to come. That's all for me for the Imperial China Project. If you like that video, go ahead and smash that like button down below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel, and be sure to check out the rest of the Imperial China Project playlist. I've linked the playlist in my description down below, as well as in the pinned comment. Head on over to Useful Charts video before mine to get familiar with the Chinese Emperor's family trees right here, or you can go further down the timeline and learn about the Han Dynasty with HWYN history over here. Also, if you like what I do and you want to support the channel, head on over to Patreon and become a patron. You get early access to all of my videos and a bunch of other really cool behind the scenes updates like when I first got my sign and designed my new YouTube set. And you also get a few other fun freebies as well. Here are all of my socials. And as always, I don't even have to say it anymore. Ah, I love it. I know it's too bright, the dimmer is on its way, but I had to show you. Stay dirty, my friends.